Recording is in progress. Oh. Oh, really? Hello, everybody. It's sorry. I'll I'll start. Okay. Hello, everybody. It's Donnie with Fire Fly Fishing Podcast, and today I've got a special guest on from Galapagos. Uh, he's he runs the Ecuador uh, Fly Fishing Tours. His name is Javier uh, Guevara. Right? That's how you pronounce it. Guevara. Guevara. Sorry, I, I'm horrible at Spanish. I try. I try really hard, but I'm just too dumb to pick it up. So just right off the bat, uh, do you live full time in Ecuador? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, actually, my operation is based out of uh, Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where my company started, um, roughly about uh, 2013. And um, my off season, I'm basically traveling all over. Uh, my off season, I'm actually here in the States. That's when I try to do most of the shows and, uh, you know, talks with the uh, uh, fishing clubs and things like that. Uh, and then my on season, I'm actually in the Galapagos or all over South America. Okay. So when actually is your season for fishing for striped marlin in Gal Galapagos? Um, so my season starts in December. Uh, December is kind of like the starting of the uh, summertime over there where weather uh, st start to get in uh, a little bit uh, warmer. Uh, the water temperature will start warm, to warm up, uh, which is perfect for uh, billfish fishing. Uh, the ocean gets pretty calm uh, between uh, December and June. Uh, after that, uh, it gets a little rocky. Um, but um, Marlene and Galapagos is a, is a uh, year-round uh, destination. So, Okay, very cool. So uh, for the listeners out there... Um... We actually met at the Dallas Safari Club uh, convention this year, and you had a very nice booth there with some really interesting video. And uh, I did a little bit of reading about stuff there at your at your booth, and it said that you were raising twenty five to forty marlin like every day all year long. So that's kind of what captured my interest in it, and that's that's why I want to fish with you, and that's why I think that other people, you know, that it's interesting for sure. So I just wanted to have you on the show to kind of talk about it a little bit so yeah i appreciate it i appreciate uh, that you have me in your show um it was great meeting you in the safari club uh dallas show um yes that's true uh the galapagos is a very special place um an average day of fishing there is uh we can definitely raise between 20 to 40 plus fish a day uh now those most of those fish are well over 200 pounds with a good average of 230 250 pounds so they are pretty big striped marlins. Um, I know there's a lot of locations in the world that you can catch them uh, in big numbers also. But um, I will say the Galapagos definitely has some of the biggest uh, striped marlin there is. We had a lot of uh, clients uh, from the States that visit other locations. And uh, they were very surprised the the size of, of the marlin that we have and the numbers, of course. Yeah, for sure. And uh, it's one of those locations that it's, kind of it's it's a national reserve right so it's very limited to how many boats can actually operate there and how many people can actually fish it at one time correct yeah that's correct it's a national park um it's a protected area uh, actually we just uh, uh months ago we celebrated uh, the expansion of the marine uh, reserve which uh, it connects all the way to the isla of cocos in uh, costa rica which it will protect uh, a lot of the species, they are uh, migrating back and forth to the island. So, yes, there's only a few boats in the Galapagos that can actually do, they call it uh, pesca vivencial, which for us kind of trans translates in the States uh, to be a sport fishing. But uh, uh, it's a way of, of, of putting uh, conservation uh, with fishing together in the Galapagos. And there's only a handful of boats that can uh, do the activity in the islands also. Okay, so is it mainly catch and release then, or is there some taking of fish, or how does that work? So with marlin, uh, it's all catch and release. Um, we we do believe in conservation definitely, and uh, now we do have some uh, bycatch uh, fish, which is uh, mahi mahi and yellowfin tuna. Uh, those we can definitely keep up to, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's. Uh, maybe 20 pounds, uh, I'm not too, too sure about it. 
but you can definitely take a few pieces back uh, home. Uh, sometimes we we catch a nice mahi or nice uh, yellowfin tuna, and uh, we we have it for lunch. Yeah, yeah, very cool. I love that. So not yeah. necessarily going out and coming back with limits. You know, I'm not really. You get four people on on a boat; they can take a lot of fish back. But um, yeah, to take something back and you know whack it on the head and have it for lunch or dinner that night, I really I really enjoy that a lot. So uh, walk me through the process of actually getting to the Galapagos. Is that difficult? No, no at all. Uh, a lot of people think that it's, uh, it's a long way to, to the Galapagos, but in reality, for most of the places and the international airports, for example, over Dallas, uh, Miami, uh, from there, usually it's about a four and a half to five hour flight to Quito, Ecuador, which is the capital. Um, and uh, in our trips, we include an overnight in, uh, in Quito, uh, which is a beautiful city to see. Uh, of course, it's part of the UNESCO uh, uh, heritage. Uh, so there's a lot of beautiful, beautiful things to see there. And um, uh, next day, we take a commercial plane all the way to the Galapagos. And um, it's about uh, an hour and 45 minute flight to San Cristobal Island. Uh, from there, your hotel is five minutes away from the airport, and uh, the beautiful thing of Galapagos is that everything is almost in walking distance. So, very cool. So, whenever you get to Quito, um, how safe is that for people that have never been there before? Um, I would say Quito is very safe. Um, definitely, like any country in uh, in the world, especially in South America, you know, you have to be careful where you are. I mean, here in Chicago. Chicago, we had to be careful where we go. So um, I would say it's not not different than that. Uh, you always have to be aware. And um, our trips are um, uh, are always accompanied by by me uh, from the beginning to the end of the trip. So you're never alone. Um, same time when when you do uh, sightseeing in Quito, like I, like I mentioned before, it's a beautiful place to to see. Uh, one of the things in the middle of the world where you know, on one side of the line, you can, they, for example, they do an experiment there where they have a sink that they move on the right side of the line and the water will go this way and they move it on the other side of the line and then water goes on the other side, the other way, the other direction. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, yes. Those are all the uh, um, guided uh, tours that we offer. Uh, the same from the beginning to the end, there's always somebody with, with our clients. What a cool thing. You're So you're right there on the equator. That's correct. Yeah. So that's that's Very probably strange. the name of the country. I'm so stupid. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, uh, there's a lot of beautiful, beautiful things to see in Ecuador. Yeah. For sure. And that's so, so much more accessible. I find that if you actually have somebody there that you're kind of under their care because they know, you know, hey, probably shouldn't go to this place over here. It's kind of dangerous, but we're safe over here. Right. And if that's you, then then that makes me feel a lot more comfortable with that. Right. Yes, so, that's correct. Uh, the trips are, are always uh, with a uh, host. Um, and in case the, the host is not available, there's always going to be a guide with you. So you will never be alone. And, and we believe that that's very important because uh, a lot of things can happen in the travel part. Uh, you know, taking the planes, uh, baggage issues. Well, there's uh, nameless uh, things that can happen in traveling, but... Uh, when you have somebody local that knows how to deal with uh, those uh, experiences, uh, it makes uh, everything uh, better, for sure. Very cool. Well, tell us a little bit about the accommodations in Galapagos itself and uh, maybe the food that you offer there. Yep, the accommodations in Galapagos are, are a little bit limited. Um, the island is small and there's not many places to stay. So we have found uh, the best uh, location to keep our our guests comfortable. Um, it's a beautiful um, hotel uh, with a pool, uh, seven minutes away, walking distance from the boat. Um, it's very comfortable. Uh, we do, most of our packages are uh, uh, double occupancy uh, and the rooms are, I mean, they're, they're very spacious, a private bedroom, there's a sauna, there's a pool, there's a bar. Um, now the food is out of this world. Uh, you have a mix of uh, Italian food, sushi, uh, American food, uh, and a lot of those places mix 
either the fresh seafood from the Galapagos or the culinary art of Ecuador mixed with, you know, uh, Italian food, let's say. It's it's just uh, amazing. So every night, um, instead of us uh, eating in one uh, place, we decided that, you know, Galapagos is an experienced place. You know, something where you take a lot of experiences, you know, the wildlife, the fishing, the, the culture. So we decided to have dinner every night in different uh, restaurants in the island. That way you can try it the gastronomy of, of, of San Cristobal. Oh, very cool. Very cool. And that's included in the price for the trip, correct? Yeah. 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 We, our, our packages are all inclusive, so uh, it is it is included. Uh, very cool. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's an interesting take on it. it I like that a lot. So, um, yeah, I mean, just just factoring in the, the fact that, um, you know, you have access to the wildlife there, you know, the, the marine iguanas, the flightless, uh, cormorants, the, all of these spectacular things, the, the turtles, you know, all of these things that are truly unique for that one area and, and to follow kind of in Darwin's footsteps, plus some of the best striped marlin fishing in the world. I mean, you've, you've got a slam dunk sort of a, sort of a situation here for, for a great trip. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I mean, the Galapagos is a very special place, a uh, well-known place for all over the world, but uh, uh, not too many people know that you can fish the Galapagos. So when you put a family destination together, such as the Galapagos, plus excellent fishing and great professional service, um, is definitely one of the top, uh, you know, fishing destinations in the world that you have to visit. Yes. Very cool. Very cool. So, um, talk to us a little bit about rigging for for these fish. What type of uh, what type of fly rods do you guys use mainly? So we provide all the fishing equipment, either fly or conventional gear. Um, with fly, we use uh, Tibor Pacific reels. Uh, we have tested a few other reels. Uh, Tibors are very simple reels, uh, very durable. Um, you know, there's not many pieces that can go wrong inside of the reel, so we have spare parts if we need to. Um, we use two different types of, of fly rods. We have uh, TFOs Blue Water series, uh, Dawson Grain, and we also have uh, Camp Stigler 14 weight uh, rods. Uh, both have different actions, so we cater to the depending you know, of the angular ability of casting. Very cool. And those are 14 weight, 16 weight rods? Yeah, they go from 14 to 16 weight. Uh, you know, our reels, for example, reels are Pacific t uh, They mm -hmm. do have about 800, 150 yards of backing, 60-pound uh, gel span. Uh, on top of that, they have uh, 80 foot of uh, uh, mono, which actually um, works as a, a big uh, elastic in between yeah. your fly line and your backing. So, so big shock tip, but yeah, when we fish uh, uh, 20 pounds, if that's required or needed by the angler, um, that definitely takes a lot of the strain in the, in the 20 pound. Yeah. Sure. So I've been told that like whenever these big fish come up and, and eat, basically you're not even strip setting them. You're you're kind of just relying on the, the drag of the reel to set the hook, correct? Um, yes, that's kind of correct. Um, so normally we set our reels at about six to seven uh, pounds. Uh, we have 30, 35 foot of line uh, stripped out in a bucket. Um, and the flighter will be just uh, sitting uh, right next to it, right, not right next to you. Uh, so when the fish comes in, you know, we we take a, a cast. There's some people that actually like casting and they do a lot of overhand casts while we're teasing the fish in which, you know, it's their preference. Uh, and it's great, actually, to see that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, most of the takes are going to be when the fish comes uh, hot to the teaser. Uh, your fly gets delivered in the water. Um, teasers are out of the water by then. And 90% of the time, the fish will be coming to your fly in a 90-degree angle. So when that happens, they grab the fly and turn around and start uh, going the opposite way of the boat. Yeah, uh, that plus the drag of the fly line uh, and the six pounds is plenty of uh, of drag to set the hook. 
Uh, we do set the hook sometimes when we see that the hookup is not the appropriate way or they don't come in the right angle. Um, but if we see that everything is happening right, uh, there's really no need for for stripping uh, the line. So very cool. So uh, do you guys have wire leaders that you use? Uh, we don't use wire leaders. We use a hundred pound uh, leaders, mm -hmm. uh, track tippet. Um, normally we use a 20 pound class um, and in other occasions uh, we use 60 pound leaders also. Very cool. So um, let's see, what, what kind of flies do you guys use there? Um, well, I think you saw some on the show. Uh, we had some in display there, but uh, yeah, our flies are between 12 to 14 inches. Um, I like to tend to use uh, Cam Ziegler style flies. Uh, so basically it's a half a chicken about 14 inches with a big popper in the front. Very cool. Um, and the other uh, fly that I like to use is a more like a bait uh, imitation fly, uh, just pure flash, uh, which it looks more like a you know a sardine or or a ballyhoo in the water. Mm -hmm. How tough is it to go back to Chicago after seeing all of this excitement? I gotta imagine it's just so beautiful <laughs> to see that bill coming out of the water and uh, bubble streams and this giant fish chasing down what you've got on the end of your fly rod. Um, I would say it has ruined everything that I used to fish for before. <laughs> uh, when you see this, uh, you know, 250 pound fish uh, coming in the water with the mouth open and the surface and grabbing your fly like you're stripping for, you know, uh, small mouth, let's say with poppers. Yeah. So just imagine, you know, the excitement there is to see a small mouth hitting your, your, your popper fly in the surface. Uh, now you have this big 200 plus pound fish uh, coming out of the water and grabbing your popper. It's it's amazing. So yeah, it's uh, it's difficult. You know, when I'm in uh, in Chicago, I tend not to do much fishing. Although I I do have a raft and we do some smallmouth around here. But uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it has definitely ruined my other type of uh, of fishing experiences. <laughs> I can imagine. So um. I, I'm sold. I can't wait to do this. I, I want to go there like tomorrow. Uh, of course I can't because I've got other obligations, but, but uh, as soon as I can, I will be there. So, yeah. Um, that'd be more definitely. So you, you have a couple of other excursions that you, that you offer. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, uh, based on the demand of our clients, um, you know, we used to be focused more in Ecuador uh, when the company started. Um, but a lot of our clients are repeated clients and they're like, well, you know, why you don't, do you have anything in uh, Colombia or Peacock Bass or Golden Dorado or, you know, Patagonia? And um, so we started getting uh, partnerships with different lodges uh, uh, in South America. Some of them are actually represented by us in the States. We have a lodge in Colombia uh, called Tucunaria Lodge. Uh, we do a lot of uh, peacock bass uh, and payara fishing, which is amazing. Uh, and payara is one of those fish that will test your skills for sure. Um, and then we have, you know, we go from the craziness to the, of the jungle to all the way to Patagonia, which is amazing. Uh, you know, we have a, a, a partner with a, with a lodge called Mata Piojo Lodge in, in Patagonia, Chile. And uh, they actually do have uh, all species of trout, uh, brown rainbows and brook trout. So you can definitely get a grand slam there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a glamping type of style uh, operation, which it was something that caught my eye because it was completely new. You know, you always hear of these beautiful lodges and huge and hotel room like. Uh, and this is like a premium safari uh, tent. I mean, it looks like a hotel inside right in the shorelines of the Futalifu River, which is amazing. You have condors flying uh, all day long. Uh, so it was just like the experience was like nothing I ever uh, uh, had before. So uh, we do some uh, also our Apaima in Ecuador, uh, which uh, is a project that we're working on right now. Uh, again, you know, our Apaima is a, a huge uh, freshwater fish, uh, it can range from 200 to 400 plus pounds. Uh, it's very aggressive. Uh, it jumps like a tarpon. So when you have a fish like that, it's just, you know, on your bucket list for sure. 
So for sure. And so beautiful too. The red, the red on their tails oh, yeah. is really uh it's striking. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would like to experience that at some point too. So uh keep us informed about uh about the development of that project for sure. And whenever you're ready to push forward with it, I'm ready to do that. So I'll do it. <laughs> Very cool, man. Well, hey, I think that uh, that we're going to go ahead and end right there. That's uh, lots of information for folks. How could people get a hold of you if they decided they wanted to go experience some of this fine fishing? Um, well, uh, we are in all the social media platforms, um, you know, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube, under Ecuador Fly Fishing Tours. Uh, you can also contact us uh, via web, uh, Ecuador, E-C-U-A-D-O-R flyfishingtours.com uh, and feel free to just send us a message on any of the platforms uh, of social media and we'll be answering uh, your questions right away. Very cool. Very cool. Is there anything that I should have asked that I didn't? Oh. Um, I'm not sure. Uh... <laughs> That's always a showstopper right there. <laughs> It's like kind of a setup um, question. I, I apologize about that if I ambushed you with that. But uh, I just like to give you one last chance to, you know, if, if there's anything that's important that I missed that um, that you can think of. No pressure. Uh, well, I would like to, you know, speak about the Galapagos uh, a bit because, uh, again, you know, it's not just a fishing tour. Um, uh, like most of the fishing tours available nowadays. Uh, it is one of those places where you can take your family, your your your, your children. Um, sometimes all of them fish. Like we had a a, a friend of us uh, came from Montana with his five children, and all five children got a, a marlin in the day. Um, so you know, and seeing these uh you know six seven year old uh, kids getting a two hundred plus fish was uh, outstanding. So. It is a family destination. There's a lot to see and do in the islands while uh, someone is fishing also. Uh, if uh, there are non-fishing companions, um, you know, snorkeling, pristine waters of uh, Galapagos, uh, you can uh, swim with sharks, hammerhead sharks, uh, marine iguanas, uh, uh, sea turtles. I mean, it's just amazing. So definitely, yeah, they have to check it out. For sure, that sounds spectacular. So trip of a lifetime for sure. Uh, very cool. Most of well, um, I believe that's, uh, that's all that I've got for you. Anything else for us? No, no, I think, uh, I think we're good. Uh, I really thank you for the opportunity to be in your, uh, in your podcast. Yeah. Um, it's, and you're still meeting. Uh, so it's a pleasure. Uh, thank, you and thank, thank you for being with us and thanks for agreeing to, uh, to come on this, this little show, but, um, I think that you're headed to great places and I think that, uh, that you've got a really good operation and that your future's bright for sure. So, and it was such a pleasure to be able to meet you and, and talk with you for the, uh, for the short amount of time that we actually got to, to speak there at the show, you got overwhelmed with business rather quickly. So, um, man, I, I look forward to speaking with you in the future and I, I hope to be able to fish with you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your kind words and, uh, I hope to fish with you also. Yeah, man. Well, that's it for us. Uh, this is Donnie with uh, the Fire Fly Fishing Podcast and um, hope to see you in the future. Cheers. Cheers. All right. I'm going to 